Okay, can you hear me okay? So I'd just like to thank Mary and the other organisers for inviting me to speak. Um, I'm a physician. I work in a diabetes centre. I spent most of my life looking after patients. Uh, I've come into sleep research um, really very recently, uh, in the past four years or so. Mary was saying the sleep field is uh, becoming you know, full of additional people uh, these days, and I guess I'm you know, one of these people that's been drawn into the field because of the interest. So I feel quite honoured to be uh, invited to speak today. I'm going to talk about um, a little bit of background, my personal motivation for getting involved in sleep uh, research and, and the work that I'll des describe here. Um, my interest in epidemiology goes into really the cardiovascular area, um, but I'd just like to highlight some of the limitations of epidemiology, and uh, particularly when we're trying to understand causation uh, and how I've been attracted by the technique of Mendelian randomization to help us understand causal pathways. Um, I'll describe the studies that we've uh, performed recently in UK Biobank in sleep and chronotype with collaborators uh, and just touch on some of the, the biological and clinical insights that we've gained from, from these, uh, these studies. Most of the work that I'm going to present is, is unpublished, actually, uh, or going to be published in the next uh, few months. So uh, hopefully it will be of interest to many people in the room here. Um, we know that sleep and circadian disruption is, uh, into, is getting into loads of areas in, in health and biology. Uh, my particular interest is uh, the relationship with cardiometabolic disease. As I said, I'm a diabetologist, so I'm very interested in diabetes, obesity, and, and the consequences of that, such as cardiovascular disease. So this is really what drew me into, into the area of research. So I set out with this particular question, um, which was, does sleep uh, or circadian disruption cause uh, cardiometabolic and chronic inflammatory diseases. I was particularly interested in uh, the causation question because uh, it's through understanding mechanisms of disease that we can really develop new treatments and potentially new ways to prevent disease. Um, diabetes in particular is a massive problem globally. Uh, we're approaching you know, one in ten of the population has type 2 diabetes and if sleep has any role to play in causing type 2 diabetes there's a potential uh, major benefit there. Sorry, this slide seems to have been a bit disrupted um, in translation. Um, so Austin Bradford Hill was the president of the Royal Society, and uh, back in the 1960s, he gave an inaugural address where he described um, nine features of a relationship between variables, between two variables that could help to uh, assess causality. So it's likely that many of you in the room are familiar with this, but it's something that sort of caught my interest. And I'm just going to take the example of whether sleep disturbance causes hyperglycemia. I reviewed the literature and summarized um, what I found in relation to these different uh, criteria. So, for example, strength of association, yes, there's uh, you know, modest association, consistency and specificity and so on. And So the more of these factors that uh, are positive, the more likely it is there is a causal relationship between uh, two variables. But as you can see, it's a little bit uh, difficult to make a, a definitive statement about whether causality is, is present or not, and really it's very unsatisfactory from a scientific point of view. So I'd just like to take a step back and talk about uh, this idea of causation, um, which is really an introduction to the idea of Mendelian randomization. Um, I don't know if many of you are familiar with the idea of Mendelian randomization studies. Show of hands, maybe? No, one or two people. Um, but I'd just like to go through a little bit here uh, for the benefit of the others. So we're particularly interested here in, in this example of sleep disturbance and, and hyperglycemia. So is there really a, a, tr a true causal relationship between uh, these, these two factors? So um, the observational epidemiology is very difficult to sort of um, to tell us this with any degree of certainty. This is what we get when we look at um, incident diabetes uh, in relation to sleep duration. So on the x-axis, we've got the number of hours of people sleeping in the UK biomark population. This is about half a million individuals. And on the y-axis, we've got the risk of developing diabetes in relation to uh, the number of hours that have been sleep, sleep, slept. Uh, this is what people recorded at baseline. So here we're looking at about 6,000 incident cases of type 2 diabetes. 
and there's this very sort of uh, interesting U-shaped relationship. So the minimum risk of uh, having diabetes is about seven hours, and you can see that the short sleepers and the longer sleepers are also at increased risk of diabetes. When I heard Vlad talking today, uh, he was saying that uh, that with sleep deprivation, we, we get a, a sort of um, a, a fallout of uh, a cortical neurons. They sort of go offline. And I stayed in quite a cheap and um, not very good hotel last night and experienced quite a bit of sleep deprivation. So I just hope there's a sufficient number of my cortical neurons that are going to sort of survive to the end of this lecture. The point I'd like to make from this slide is that um, if we're just postulating that there's a single mechanistic uh, explanation between sleep duration and the risk of diabetes, it, it doesn't fit with these data, does it? Because um, longer sleep is associated with a higher risk, but also shorter sleep is associated with a higher risk of developing diabetes. So there's fake news somewhere here. It might be that both relationships are not describing a causal relationship. It might be that there's just association uh, through confounding factors. And, and this is a very important thing to, to consider when it comes to epidemiology. I'll just give you a bit more uh, insight into this from the point of view of this example. So confounding, uh, what do we mean by that? So we've got this idea of sleep disturbance being related to hypoglycemia, but what factors could explain this? Sleep apnea is a great example of this. So um, sleep apnea clearly causes sleep disturbance, but it also causes changes in our autonomic nervous system, changes in our hormone levels that can lead to hypoglycemia directly. So there may not be any true relationship, any causal relationship between sleep disturbance and hypoglycemia in this example. It may be all explained by a third variable. What about re reverse causality? How might that be relevant in this particular example? So um, a good example is neuropathic pain. So glucose levels, when they're elevated, cause nerve damage. Nerve damage can be painful, and pain can wake people at night time. Classically, that's what happens with people with painful neuropathy in, in diabetes. Uh, and of course, nocturia as well. So if you've got high glucose levels, you tend to get up at night time, go to the loo, and that leads to sleep disturbance. So there's, there's a few ways in which reverse causality could also be relevant. Um, we looked at this uh, in a clinical study. Um, we took 50 people with type 2 diabetes, excluded those with sleep apnea, excluded those with neuropathic pain, and excluded those with high glucose levels that could cause nocturia. And this was in an attempt to diminish these factors of confounding and, and reverse causality. We measured glucose levels using um, uh, a device which was uh, fitted under the skin, recording glucose over about a week or so. Um, we looked at sleep uh, through an activity monitor and quantified that. And this is this time looking at sleep duration on the x-axis, but the nighttime glucose, average nighttime glucose, and again, we see this U-shaped relationship that was significant um, when we did the statistics. So both the long sleepers and the short sleepers are high glucose levels. So even when we exclude some of these factors, uh, we're still seeing these unusual U-shapes, which may be due to unmeasured confounding, of course. So I think when it comes to studying humans, uh, and we're trying to understand causal relationships, confounding and reverse causality is a major problem. And, um, when we're using animal models and cellular models, we can do things like perturb genes and uh, change things in causal pathways, and we can get a good idea about what might be relevant as far as the cause is concerned. But when we're studying humans, we're not, we don't have really that, um, that, uh, that benefit. So what are the potential solutions? Well, we could do clinical trials. We could intervene on some of these things to see what sort of outcome we have as far as our... Um, so diabetes or obesity is concerned, but it's quite difficult to do and um, you know, very costly, and we have to be you know, fairly sure about our hypothesis before we'd embark on something like that. But I'm going to talk a bit about this technique of Mendelian randomization. I think we can think of this in terms of hierarchy of um, um, data. I think it comes somewhere between a clinical trial and a, a well-designed observational study. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the contributions of Jack Bowden and Debbie Lawler, who are based in Bristol, who are uh, sort of leading uh, international names in, in the area of Mendelian randomization. They've contributed to these studies that I'll describe uh, later on. 
So just a bit about uh, the idea behind Mendelian randomization. We're using genes as a surrogate this time for sleep disturbance. We're trying to understand uh, and get at this relationship here, whether there is truly a causal relationship between sleep disturbance and hyperglycemia. But we're using a gene or genes that are a proxy for sleep. And then we're looking at the relationship between the genes in sleep and the genes in hyperglycemia to infer this relationship here. So let's just talk a little bit more about that. I don't want to sort of labor this too much, but uh, just to give you an idea, let's say that the true uh, unconfounded causal relationship between this exposure and the outcome, whatever it is, uh, it gives a beta coefficient of 0.5. And we have uh, a similar strength of relationship between a gene or genes and exposure. This is totally hypothetical. I just want to give you the idea that um, the relationship between the gene and the outcome, if there was nothing else involved in this system, uh, the relationship there, the beta coefficient, will be uh, 0.25. So we're looking at the product of the two, um, explaining, uh, giving the product of, the, of these relationships here. So that's, that's the way it would work from a mathematical point of view. And of course, we don't know the true uh, strength of the relationship between the exposure and the outcome, but by... Uh, doing a bit of rearrangement that uh, I think even my 13-year-old daughter would be able to manage, um, we can infer the true uh, unconfounded relationship between the exposure and the outcome by uh, dividing the relationship between the gene and the outcome and uh, the gene and the exposure. So that's the basic principle behind Mendelian randomization. In this example, we've got sleep disturbance and hyperglycemia. Um, we're replacing uh, the relationships with the outcome of the gene and the glucose and the gene in sleep. So this is uh, an example where we've got one single nucleotide polymorphism. We've plotted the beta coefficient between the gene and glucose levels on the y-axis, and we've plotted the relationship between the gene and uh, sleep disturbance on the x-axis, and the gradient of the line is this uh, gene glucose, gene sleep um, uh, ratio. And all we're looking at really is the gradient of this line. And if we can prove statistically that the gradient is not the same as zero, then we've got evidence of a causal relationship being present between, uh, between sleep disturbance and glucose. It is basically as simple as that. And of course, in practice, we'd use more than one single nucleotide polymorphism. We'd have several genes, and we'd take the average level uh, of the gradient uh, when we're looking across different SNPs. Now, it isn't quite as simple as that because there are some assumptions in Mendelian randomization that we need to be very cautious about, such as genes not um, being related to confounders that could lead to hyperglycemia, and no other pathways that lead from genes to hyperglycemia. But there are ways that we can statistically assess the importance of that sort of relationship. So with that fairly uh, long introduction, I'd like to lead on to the studies that we've been doing in UK Biobank because I think um, understanding the principles behind many randomization is quite important. Um, UK Biobank is just an amazing resource. Um, and the, I think the people who put this together, the people who have the vision to do this, you know, really need... Um, you know, major congratulations. So UK Biobank involves half a million uh, individuals that were recruited from several centres around the UK. And they all had um, baseline assessments of sleep and chronotype from a touchscreen questionnaire. And we've also made use of um, 100,000 individuals who had acti actigraphy, uh, and they had these devices worn for around about a week. We've got good data on about five days for the majority of those people, so in about 85,000 people in our studies, and we've quantified sleep. Um, but there's lots of other things that are relevant, um, potentially particularly of interest to me, uh, where I have an interest in diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So all these people were genotyped at baseline, <coughs> along with this, at the time they had this, this questionnaire, one limitation is that there was only a 5% participation rate, so there is some selection in UK Biobank. I'm not sure that uh, the population involved is truly representative of the UK population. In fact, we know that they're not. They tend to be a healthier subgroup. So we just need to be a bit cautious in the, the conclusions that we draw from, for that reason. Um, <coughs> so when I was thinking about putting this study together, I uh, asked one of my mentors who the best person in sleep genetics is. Um, 
in his experience and he put me in touch with uh, Richard Saxena and uh, she was the first person that I uh, discussed this project with and Jackie Lane um, came on board pretty quickly uh, and we've developed the study to involve m many others since then. So these are various people that are in uh, Richard's lab and uh, since then Mike Whedon and collaborators uh, in Exeter have, have come on board, particularly uh, Sam Jones and Tim Frailing. Jack and Debbie I've mentioned before who've contributed to the Mendelian randomization. And uh, I don't really want to take any credit for the work that I'm going to present next because uh, it has been done largely by, by these individuals and, and without them there'd be nothing to present, so uh, I'm indebted to them. Uh, that, that isn't a command by the way, I'd like you to stay awake for at least a bit more of the, of the presentation. Uh, sleep uh, duration was assessed by touchscreen questionnaire. So this question was, uh, how many hours of sleep do you get in every 24 hours? And people just recorded a number, seven hours, eight hours. And um, our first genome-wide association study was done in 120,000 people. There were two releases of the genetic data in UK Biobank, so we had our first bite at the cherry, if you like, um, and we published this uh, a couple of years ago now. Uh, and we didn't pick up very much, and I think one of the things I'd like to make, one of the points I'd like to make is that with a sample size of 120,000 people, we still couldn't identify very many uh, genomic regions that were related to, to this particular phenotype. Um, but then when the second wave of genetic data came through in UK Biobank, where we had uh, data on about half a million individuals, we identified 78 loci for self-reported sleep duration. So why is this important? Well, from, from the point of the Mendelian randomization studies, we're, we're then able to explain a reasonable amount of the variance of sleep, um, but still not a large amount. So from actigraphy, we can assess that people who are in the tails of the distribution for genetic risk score, so the people with a high score for um, sleep duration or a low score for sleep duration, those people in the extremes of the distribution only differed in 10 by 10 minutes in their sleep duration. So we're not explaining a large proportion of the variance of sleep, but we're explaining enough to get a handle on, on causal relationships. So um, it will be interest to some of the, in, in the room here, that uh, the pathways that we identified based on these uh, genomic regions and the genes that are close to where the SNPs are, they're linked to dopamine pathways, uh, synaptic neurotransmission, catecholamine production, orexin and GABA pathways are all represented in, in the pathways. Um, we also showed that sleep duration was related to uh, daytime inactivity and sleep efficiency when we looked at the actigraphy monitoring. When we go to look at genetic correlation, this is where we look at the genome-wide association studies that have been done for things like type 2 diabetes and coronary heart disease, and we look at um, the overlap of genes that are related to um, these particular phenotypes in relation to sleep duration, we can see that there's a, a reasonable correlation for, um, for some of these conditions. Um, so, for example, there are relationships with um, uh, bipolar disorder, which was significant, and uh, when we look at short sleep, we've got relationships with depression and so on. So I'm not sure that genetic correlation tells us much about causation, but I think it just gives us an idea about uh, our hardwired uh, physiology, uh, that there are you know, uh, relationships between these things at a genetic level. Now as far as Mendelian randomization is concerned, we looked at long sleep and we found a causal relationship or evidence of a causal relationship with schizophrenia. And um, we didn't show any relationship with diabetes, uh, which was a bit of a surprise to myself. But uh, I didn't just ditch the project at that point. I'm you know, happy to carry on with it. But I'd just like to show you something that is really hot off the press. Uh, we only submitted this paper two days ago. Um, but we showed that there's evidence of a causal relationship between short sleep duration and coronary heart disease from the Mendelian randomization. So I'd just like to focus here on um, the two-sample Mendelian randomization. This is probably the most reliable way of doing Mendelian randomization. 
um, where we're looking in another cohort at um, the risk of um, coronary heart disease using the, um, the betas that we get from, from UK Biobank. Uh, so this is probably the least biased way of looking at this. So what they're saying here is that longer sleep duration is associated with a lower risk of having coronary heart disease. Um, this is where we're looking at short sleep duration as a, a discrete um, predictor. So if you've got short sleep duration, um, there's a 1.24 higher odds of, of having coronary heart disease per doubling of the risk of, of having short sleep duration. It's a bit of a difficult way to sort of present the data, but um, the important point is that we're showing you know, fairly clear evidence of a causal relationship between having short sleep and having coronary heart disease uh, in, in this uh, new data. So as I said, that's just been submitted and um, we'll develop this idea further on because it's relevant in the insomnia work. Moving on to insomnia, uh, do you have trouble falling asleep at night or do you wake up in the middle of the night? Uh, and there were just a few responses, never rarely, sometimes, usually prefer not to answer. Uh, and that's all we had really on insomnia. I'm just going to jump straight to the, the second release of, of UK uh, Biobank genetic data. This time we identified 57 loci for reported uh, insomnia. Um, we validated many of these in uh, other, other cohorts. Um, I'd like to just highlight a couple of things here. There was genetic correlation with restless leg syndrome. That may not surprise um, many of the people in the room here, but it also showed genetic correlation with uh, cardiometabolic, behavioral, and psychiatric traits. We showed that there was evidence of a causal relationship between insomnia and coronary heart disease, again, uh, but also depressive symptoms and subjective well-being. Uh, and they were pretty robust. This has just been accepted by Nature Genetics. Uh, it is available on uh, BioArchive at the moment, so if you're interested in the details of this publication, uh, you can look that up now. So we showed uh, evidence of causality uh, between restless leg syndrome and, um, and insomnia as well in many of the randomization. And it may be that <coughs> hyperarousal is, uh, is a common etiology for both, both uh, restless leg syndrome and insomnia. So finally, as far as the sleep uh, section is concerned, I'm going to talk about daytime sleepiness. How likely are you to doze off or fall asleep during the day uh, when you don't mean to? And again, there were different options that people could uh, respond to to that question. Again, uh, asked of half a million people. This was our first attempt um, at uh, doing a genome-wide association study. Uh, and we didn't really pick up very much. There was a locus near the androgen receptor. Um, but it was only when we did uh, the larger study in 450,000 individuals that we identified a large number of SNPs. 42 were identified this time. Um, and um, again, there was genetic correlation with coronary heart disease and some psychiatric diseases. And as far as the Mendelian randomization is concerned, we showed that um, obesity led to excessive daytime sleepiness, but the reverse was not true. So uh, it was obesity that seemed to be the driver for excessive daytime sleepiness uh, based on those analyses, which is interesting. So as far as the sleep summary is concerned, um, we showed that genetic variation plays a role in sleep behavior, that sleep traits are related to cardiometabolic, cognitive, and psychiatric dis uh, disorders and traits. Using Mendelian randomization, we showed that insomnia and short sleep, um, there was evidence of causality for coronary heart disease. Long sleep was causally related to schizophrenia, and obesity uh, showed evidence of causality for daytime sleepiness. Moving on now to chronotype. Um, this was, again, touchscreen questionnaire. People were asked a simple question, do you consider yourself to be a morning person, and so on, and th these are the 
So definitely a morning person, more of a morning person than an evening person. So a fairly crude assessment of chronotype. Um, and again, this was our first attempt at genome-wide association studies uh, using a, a relatively small number of uh, individuals. But um, I just skipped to this. We combined data from 23 and me. Uh, and also UK Biobank, and this time we had uh, nearly 700,000 individuals. Uh, we identified 350 loci for being a morning person. And this time we were able to identify, uh, to capture quite a fair proportion in the sleep timing. So using actigraphy, we showed that those people that were in the tails of the distribution for a genetic risk score for chronotypes are the people who had um, so a high score for morningness versus a low score for morningness. The difference in sleep timing comparing those two groups was about 25 minutes. So we're able to explain a reasonable amount of, uh, of sleep timing you know, through these genetic markers. As you might expect, the loci were enriched with genes involved in circadian rhythm, rhythm insulin pathways, uh, and there were also um, overexpression of um, genes related to the retina, the hindbrain, hypothalamus, and pituitary, as we might expect from some of the talks that we've had today. Now, in the conventional epidemiology, there's um, a strong relationship between being um, a, a night owl uh, and being obese and having type 2 diabetes. It's been in many, many papers. But in fact, we showed no evidence of causality linking chronotype to type 2 diabetes or obesity, which I think was a bit of a surprise. So a very relevant negative finding. Um, we showed that morningness um, was actually associated with a lower risk of uh, having schizophrenia or depression using Mendelian randomization, which again is interesting. This paper is also uh, available to view on the sort of preprint uh, by archive. Uh, it's under review at the moment by uh, Nature Communications, and we expect that it's going to go through fairly soon, but we'll see. So again, interesting uh, and quite provocative data. I'd just like to say a few words uh, coming towards the end of the talk now on the activity monitoring. Vincent van Hees looks very pleased with himself here, but uh, Vincent's had a, a major role to play in working with the UK Biobank data here. Um, so he's taken these um, activity monitoring traces from <coughs> 85,000 people uh, and has converted these into um, sleep measures. Further off. And um, so the algorithm that he has used was trained based on PSG um, data. And um, so this is an example of activity during the day and the night in different planes. It's three axes. And uh, as I said, his software has been able to generate uh, uh, sleep trait summary statistics that I'll cover a little bit more in this uh, next panel. So here we're integrating you know, the, the movement in, in three planes. We're looking at the time when people are least active, the time of the day when people are most active. We'll be able to assess sleep duration. And uh, these measures were derived from the actigraphy. So we've got sleep duration, um, uh, sleep duration variability. We've got the midpoint of sleep the time when people were most active and least active, sleep efficiency defined as this, a number of sleep episodes and so on. So we've done genome-wide association studies for all of these uh, particular outcomes. So using those data, we identified 47 genetic associations with these eight sleep traits. Uh, Ten of these were novel for sleep duration. Um, and. Um, the sleep fragmentation loci were enriched for serotonin processing genes. Uh, and again, we showed this relationship between uh, restless leg syndrome and poorer quality sleep uh, and later sleep as well. <coughs> this paper's also uh, been submitted for publication, and uh, I expect that it'll come through fairly soon. So if you're interested in the details of that, it's available also on BioArchive. Richard Saxena, the geneticist that has been most closely involved uh, with the earlier work, um, has made our summary statistics available on this uh, browser, which is Sleep Disorders Genetics. So if you have a particular gene that you're interested in and would like to know a little bit more about, 
uh, its relationships to these outcomes, you can uh, study them through this web browser. And I think the genome of associated studies are really just the beginning. So we're just able to identify a genomic region uh, that is associated with these particular phenotypes. It doesn't mean that the gene that's next door to where the SNP is is causal. Uh, it, it may be, but it might be that there's a, a other relationships that are more complex, and there's a huge amount of work that needs to be done now to really uh, uncover the mechanisms that link these genetic markers with the outcomes of interest, uh, such as cardiovascular disease uh, and some of these psychiatric diseases. So these are some of the ways that um, are currently being pursued to identify. And it was great to hear some of the work that's being done in zebrafish, I think very exciting. And we're very interested to develop some of that work uh, in, in relation to the studies that we're doing as well. Um, we can look at how people differ in terms of their EEG when they've got different genotypes. We can look at circadian studies. I'll touch on one of them in a minute. Um, we can do phenome-wide association studies to look at the other uh, physical traits that are related to these genotypes to get a deeper understanding of you know, how mechanisms uh, of disease can, can occur. We had some fantastic work presented today uh, in relation to Drosophila. So um, we're doing some work in Drosophila in, in Boston, taking some of these hits uh, that we found from the genome wide association <coughs> study, identifying nearby genes that are orthologs of those, uh, and then looking at how these um, perturbation in the genes, we're doing RNA uh, knockdown experiments to see how behavior changes in response to perturbing these, these genes. Um, and just another example uh, of some work that's been done in deep phenotyping. So here we're using um, uh, a protocol uh, where people are sort of go into, um, into synchrony and um, we're looking at how people with different genotypes have uh, different circadian periods for things like temperature, uh, melatonin period, um, and uh, that work is also under review at the moment. So just an example of some of the ways that we can start to understand a bit more about the, the mechanisms that underline these genetic associations. So just finally, um, I'd like to just summarize by saying that we've made some progress in defining the genes that uh, underlie sleep patterns and circadian rhythms, but this is really just the beginning, I think, of a lot of work that will follow. Um, we've got evidence of shared underlying biology with cardiometabolic and psychiatric diseases. Um, we've shown that long sleep duration and evenness is causally related to schizophrenia. Insomnia is causal for depression and coronary heart disease, and short sleep duration is ca causal also for coronary heart disease. And um, there's many functional and translation studies that are going to follow on you know, from this. I think it's important to thank the people who've contributed to UK Biobank, not just the people who've designed this, the study, but also the participants. Half a million people in the UK have taken part in these studies, and I think it's just an amazing resource, and I'd encourage people to use it. I'd like to thank the team that have been involved in generating the work that I've discussed. So again, you know, these individuals, but others as well. Um, so these are people in Manchester uh, and in, in the UK that have been involved in these studies and uh, also people in, in, uh, in Boston, but also in Germany and, uh, and other areas as well. So it's been a real team effort to get to this point. We've got lots of other studies going on that are outside the work I've presented, uh, but it's certainly a very exciting time uh, for people working in this area. So thank you very much indeed for listening. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, we have about five minutes for questions, please. Um, uh. Hi. <clears throat> yeah, it's a very nice talk. I have actually a lot of questions, but I, I just have two that are of special interest to me. Uh, the first one is the issue of confounders for Mendelian randomization. In general, how, how much do you think that's a real problem in, 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 uh, in the assumptions that we make? Um, because I, I think that's a real important issue. And, and in, in relation to that, I, I was struck with the relationship between uh, what you said, like short sleep and coronary heart disease, for example. You know, I, I, I know that there's a very strong relationship also with RLS and coronary heart disease, or at least, and PLMs, 
rather PLMs and, and, and coronary heart disease. And then I've noticed for quite a while that MACE1, which is one of the key genes for, um, for um, RLS with the strongest effect, so is also a very strong, is, is also MES2, is also in the heart, and MES2, MICE2, is actually also a very important gene for uh, heart. So I, I'm just wondering how much there could be this kind of cross pathways, maybe between the heart and the brain, and how this, you know, we may be making assumptions about what's happening in the brain, which is happening in parallel in some subset of cells in the heart with similar mechanism. I know it's a little bit kind of a fuzzy question, the way I'm asking yeah. it. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I think uh, it's a great question, and I don't think we should interpret Mendelian randomization as proof uh, that there's a causal relationship. I think it is, um, it's much better than traditional epidemiology, yeah. um, but it may fall short of you know, a proof. I think it's highly suggestive. There are techniques that can be <laughs> used um, that are used... All the data that I present in here is fairly robust to the sensitivity analyses that we've applied mm -hmm. to adjust for pleiotropic effects of these SNPs. So um, I think you know, we're fairly confident. As far as we can go with the traditional uh, methodology, we've, we've taken the MR work as far as we can, and I think we're, we're fairly confident that what we're describing here is, is robust. Yeah. As far and as the mechanisms are concerned, it is, you know, and it is, that's the next stage really, and I think it's very exciting that we've got animal models, you know, like flies and the zebrafish to explore <laughs> how some of these SNPs can cause vascular disease. I'd, I'd be delighted to get involved with some zebrafish work and, and maybe understand a bit more about how some of these genetic um, uh, polymorphisms can influence vascular pathology. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's an exciting area. And um, another, another question I had is this very important relationship that we're trying to find, we're starting to find between psychiatric disorder and sleep, which I think is really important. And of course, you mentioned a lot of long sleep and schizophrenia. I have a special interest in that, and long sleep and bipolar, because bipolar and schizophrenia are a little similar. But what's annoying is you also have short sleep and depression. Depression and bipolar, I mean, they have a lot of common phenotype. This also annoys me a lot, is how can you have both short sleep associated with depression and then maybe long sleep associated with bipolar? And I'm just wondering how you kind of... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I know there's a lot of questions it, we don't yeah, have Yeah, it's, it's a very difficult one. And, and of course, um, all we can do is just present the data as it comes to us. And um, I, I, I'd hope that, you know, the data still be relevant in those particular disease conditions. I suppose there's opportunities for, for prevention. Potentially, there's opportunities for treatment, uh, and it might be that you know the data is relevant to those particular patient groups, and we'll be able to design interventions potentially influencing sleep that can have benefits. So it may be that there's different interventions for different conditions, um, and that there isn't a you know a, a catch-all treatment for everything. There is a question on the back, please. Um, yes, we, we haven't done that, but I think uh, in one of the analyses that we've done, we've adjusted for chronotype um, to try and see you know, if there was any, and it didn't make any difference. So I don't think that, um, I don't think they're, they're related, they're sort of separate, separate things, but there's certainly no relationship causally between evening chronotype and type 2 diabetes and obesity, which is, you know, a bit surprising to us all, but uh, that, that's what we're seeing here. So that's, again, probably a relationship that's explained by confounding somehow. Uh, and I have a very quick question. You mentioned PAX-8 um, association with sleep. So what, what exactly was related to sleep duration? Or? Um, yeah, that was a sleep duration um, SNP, and that came out of the very first genome wide association study. Uh, this is a transcription factor, I think, in the thyroid, but I, I don't think... Uh, I have a very good understanding of how that can potentially influence sleep. 
actually Paxit, you're right, I've looked at Paxit a little bit. Paxit is not only in the thyroid, you're right, it's made mostly in the thyroid, but it's also, imp I mean, involved in the ponto mesencephalic junction in the, you know, there is expression in that area. So it might be also involved in the development of some, some, some of the sleep regulatory network. Okay. It's not only a thyroid uh, regulatory uh, factor. But also metabolism. Also metabolism? Uh, yes, you're right. But it's not only the thyroid. I mean, it's also in the brain. Yeah, okay. So it could really be involved directly in the... That's interesting. I, I could never work it out why it would be relevant in sleep if it's in, just in the thyroid. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. okay, thank you very much, Martin. And I'd like to, to thank all the speakers for their participation. <laughs>